Welcome everybody to this um, briefing and thank you for joining us and thank you to our speakers whom I will um, let them introduce themselves as we, as we go through. Um, the objective of this morning is really just to round up everything that's going on around the UK and I think this is one of the important things we want to get across today is that there's a lot of activity on sheep scab across the UK, um, a lot of um, things people are doing, a lot of commitment, and it's really to just give people a flavour of that. Unfortunately, some things are still behind wraps, and so we'll just be able to hint at the fact that there's more to come, um, but uh, we'll hopefully give you um, a round robin as to where we are. So I think, Joe, if people want to type questions as we go through, that will be fine, and hopefully we will have time at the end also for um, people to um, have a bit of a discussion. Um, so I think, Joe, without more of ado, seeing as I, I've managed to get that far without going out. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce Stu Burgess first. Um, Stu from the Mordon, I'll let you introduce yourself, but Stu is very much at the helm of the um, English RDPE project. And then we will hear from a representative from each of the three regions that are um, involved in this, um, who will give you a bit more detail on what they're doing. So Stu, if I could hand over to you at that point. That's great. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, I'll just quickly share these slides. So for those of you who don't know, um, know me, I'm uh, Stuart Burgess. I'm based at the Mordum Research Institute in uh, just outside of Edinburgh. Can you see those slides? Is that okay? Perfect. Good. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what's been happening with the RDPE funded scab control program in in england which is what leslie alluded to there um and i'll not i'll try not to give up too much away because i'm conscious that we have then some speakers from the individual regions in the project who are going to give you a, a more detailed um update but i'm just going to introduce the actual project really um and some of the concepts behind that uh, so the, sorry the project is called for flocks sake uh, let's stop scab together which obviously you need to pronounce very, very carefully. Um, and so just a quick update on where we are now with sheep scab. So it was obviously eradicated um, back in 1952, um, reintroduced with some in infested sheep coming uh, back in from um, Ireland in 1972, and then very close to, to being um, eradicated again, but sadly um, not. And then the, the disease or control of the disease was deregulated in 1992. Um, and really from that point onwards, the, um, the incidence, the prevalence of the disease has, has just gone up. Um, it's now considered endemic across the UK with 10 to 15% of farmers experiencing scab in, in any one year. Um, somewhere between eight and 10,000 outbreaks a year. And we do have some updated costs on the impact of the, the disease to the UK um, uh, sheep industry. And that's somewhere between 80 and 200 million pounds a year. So very significant costs on top of the welfare um, concerns of the disease, of course, as well. And um, there are a number of challenges to control. And, and the, this is you know, probably reasons why we haven't been able to get on top of the disease um, uh, in, in the last sort of uh, couple of decades. So we have a, an over-reliance on just two classes of drugs, the macrocyclic lactone or ML injectables, and then the organophosphate uh, or OP um, plunge dip. So there's really no new drugs on the horizon. Um, so we're very much reliant on just these two classes. And of course, the MLs are very heavily relied on for the control of gastrointestinal um, nematodes or roundworms in, in sheep as well. So it's not a great situation in terms of control. Um, there is a habitually um, a reliance on routine whole flock treatments and these are obviously costly and quite often ineffective because they're, they're often not given either at the right time um, or they are um, not coordinated um, amongst, amongst uh, neighbours. Um, we also have uh, some non-validated means of control and by this I mean using the OP uh, dips, the OP plunge dips through um, through uh, sort of, you know, kind of uh, not, uh, through, through mechanisms that haven't been proven to, to be effective, for example, showers and uh, jetters. Um, there is some advantages. We do have some, some, some positives here that SCAB is focused in, in clusters 
clusters or hotspots. And you can see those highlighted here on, on this map. And, and these do represent key control points for, for the disease. So there's some positives here. Um, but what we do know is that coordination of control is crucial. Um, that what we're doing, what we have been doing up until now has not been working. Um, and therefore we do need a, a slightly different approach. And that, that's really what we're trying to achieve through the, the RDPE project. Um, on top of that, we do have um, uh, the threat of, of macrocyclic lactone injectable resistance, which was reported back in 2018. And that is now just increasing and spreading now across the, across the UK. Um, so we do have to manage that, that method of treatment very carefully. Um, a couple, another advantage that we have is that we, we now have a, a sheep scab blood test. So it's, it's, it's a very um, a big development in that it can detect scab within two weeks of an infestation and more importantly before those clinical signs um, appear. Um, we recommend you use it as a whole flock or management group test and you need to test 12 sheep in a, in a flock or, or group as a, as a minimum. Um, and it really is a, an important tool in how we um, in how we deal with scab and how we think about scab as well, um, because we can now start to get on top of the disease. We can start to find scab before it has a chance to spread, and that gives us that chance to to intervene before it, it, it gets before it becomes worse in in individual outbreaks. Uh, so, how does the test work? So, the test detects antibodies against a, a protein from the sheep scab mite, yeah. which is uh, this one up here, Seroptes ovis. Um, and, sorry, that's the doorbell. Um, and that will be followed by the dog, I'm afraid as well. So, um, so yeah, so, so the mite um, fecal pellets contain allergens and then the, um, the, uh, the, the, the sheep then generates these antibodies against those, those, those uh, proteins. And it's these antibodies that we're then picking up with the, with the blood test. And, and they can be picked up within about two weeks of an infestation. Um, those antibodies though remain in the blood for three to six months after treatment. So there is a residual level of antibodies even after a successful treatment. So we have to take that into account when we're using the blood test. Um, so the test really just tells you if the animal has been exposed to the mite, um, but it, it isn't able to distinguish between an infested and a recently treated um, sheep. So that's one of the limitations of the, of the test. And you can see that here. So this just shows you the test results. So this is um, pre-infestation. Then with infestation, you can see that those antibody levels increase. And here we've then treated that animal. Um, and you can see that those blood, that those antibody levels then start to come down. So when we take a snapshot, which is what the blood test gives us, we don't know which side of that curve we are in terms of increasing or decreasing antibody levels. So when we interpret the outcome of the test, we do have to know what has happened um, in recent months in terms of sheep scab history and any treatments that are, that are being given. So we do need that information in order to get the best use of the, of the test. Um, so how many sheep do you need to test in a flock? I mentioned that you need to test 12. So initially, if you think about an infestation in a flock, relatively few sheep will be affected following uh, the infestation. And so if we randomly select an animal, a single animal um, from that flock to test, then the chances of us picking up that one infested animal are quite, are quite small. So the more animals we test, the greater, we, the greater chance we have of, of picking that up. And the optimum number um, for this particular test um, appears to be about, about 12 animals as a, as a, as a minimum. Um, just to show you how the test can work. So these are some, some lambs that were in, infested um, with sheep scab um, at the, at the Mordun. Um, and you can see at the moment, they're not really showing ma massive amounts of clinical signs, um, but you can see just some areas here of discoloration where they've just had a little nibble at their, at their fleeces. Um, and then if you, if you go in and just sort of highlight those, you can just see those, those areas um, here and, and here on this animal. Um, if you then clip the fleece away, under this part here, you can see that there's a lesion here that's about the size of a 50 pence coin. Again, those are, there's probably quite a, quite a few mites in there, but that would be quite difficult to, to, to find. Um, and then here, this other animal, again, that area of disruption, but when you clip away the fleece, no signs whatsoever in terms of any lesions there. 
Um, but interestingly, both of those animals are positive on the ELISA test. So it's picking up that early lesion, but perhaps more importantly, in this animal here, where there's no obvious lesion, it's also picking that up as well. Um, so just to come on to the for flocks sake uh, project, so it aims to demonstrate um, that we can target sheep scab in a coordinated way using these, this important tool that we have, which is that, is that blood test. But we're focusing on those hotspot areas that I, I highlighted earlier. So it's funded by the RDPE. Um, it started back in January um, 2021. So we're just over a year into the, into the project and it runs pretty much until the end of this year. Um, so we're working with clusters of farms within those hotspot regions. And these are the regions that we're working in. We're working in the Northwest um, with the, the farmer network as the, the coordinators, the Midlands where ADAS are the local coordinators, and then the Southwest where we have NSA as the coordinators. Um, so the, the way this project works is that we, first of all, we identify clusters of farms and then engage to recruit those um, farmers involved. We hold cluster meetings to tell them about the project, bring them together and get them thinking collectively about uh, sheep scab. There are then individual farm visits to talk, uh, talk about scab, but also to get some information on farm practice and um, history around sheep scab and, uh, and some of the risk factors for that particular farm. We then, uh, the vets, the local vets then go out and uh, blood sample for the ELISA. Um, they have two of those blood tests available, one in the first year, one in the second year. And then the vets are also able to go out and do an advisory visit to give them individual um, advice on scab control as well. Um, and then finally, we have some follow-up cluster meetings when required. And also where the treatments are required, the costs for that aren't covered by the project, but we are able to try to help to coordinate those, um, those treatments. So just to show those um, hotspots. So these are the hotspots here, and, and this is predicted really on the density of the sheep population and the degree of connectivity between those um, properties. And actually on the graph on the left here, the map on the left, you can see actual outbreak data of, of sheep scab. And what you'll notice is that actually they overlay pretty well. So just basing um, on density and connectivity of farms, you can actually predict um, sheep, scab sheep scab risk quite, quite, um, quite closely. Um, so why focus on, on these hotspots? And I've just highlighted the three hotspots that we're focusing on here. So first of all, if we are able to synchronize um, testing and treatment, then we think that's the most practically effective and economical um, strategy for controlling scab. Um, we can also coordinate action and that's really important because otherwise when people treat their, their flocks are then vulnerable to infection to, to reinfection from neighbours who haven't treated so it's important we coordinate those efforts um, between between farms. We think this may also help to reduce the spread of resistant mites that I talked about earlier and it's a much more cost effective um, strategy nationwide, focusing on the hotspots rather than focusing on a blanket pro um, program across the UK. Um, and also those clusters of farmers working together, <coughs> excuse me, are also more likely to succeed, but also more likely to go on and, and succeed in other control programs as well, because they're now communicating um, on more, hopefully more, more effectively. Um, so where are we now? Um, the project started in January. We hope to recruit 300 farmers across those three regions. Um, clusters of farms were identified in all three hotspot areas. Some had, um, some of the regions have just a few clusters, others have um, a, a larger number of clusters and those clusters vary in, in size. They can divide up the 100 farms each how, how, they, how they wish. Um, the individual farm visits were conducted from May and those are now largely complete. Um, cluster meetings were held from June 2021 and again some of those follow-up meetings are now underway. Um, most of the blood sampling, the first round blood sampling is, is now complete as well so that, that's been a big, a big effort. Um, we held VET CPD events back in August and we're continuing that, that engagement as, as we move through the project and now those VET advisory visits that I mentioned are now underway across the project as well. And as those results come through, we feed those directly to the vets and to the coordinators so that they can then instigate any treatments with the, with the farmers um, as required. So we're now, what, 13 months in. Um, interest and uptake has been very good. 
Um, most have been extremely positive, um, but but some individuals, you know, have been reluctant to join the project, but we have been able to, to bring most people in, into the fold. Um, we have fully recruited the 300 farmers that we set out to do so, and we've had to turn people away, which is obviously a very good sign. Um, there are some issues around insufficient resources in that we would probably like to have more capacity for blood testing, um, but we, where we are is, is where we are, and we have been able to manage it um, to date. So, um, but the bottom line is that, that, that for future programmes, more blood testing capacity is, is very helpful. Um, just to show you something from the um, Northern cluster. Um, so this just, just shows the percent of farms that were positive within, within each of these clusters. And, and this is really important because this cluster four here has a very high rate of, of positivity. Um, but actually that, that cluster weren't sure they really wanted to join the project because they didn't believe at the time that they had a big issue um, with sheep scab. So it just goes to show you, um, you know, the importance of having that blood test so that you can actually go in and, and, um, and see what the problem is on, on the ground and then try to resolve it. Um, beyond going to the individual clusters, which I think we'll, we'll move to now, um, there's also issues, of course, around here. We're, we're looking at England. But SCAB obviously doesn't appreciate boundaries and, um, and borders. Um, and so we do have to try to generate that more coordinated approach when we look at those um, different devolved uh, nation responses as well. Um, and that, that's me. So I'm, I'll just hand back over to um, Leslie and stop sharing those slides. There you go. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks. Sorry, my, I'm coming and going, so I'll, I'll try and segue this now. So, so that's a brilliant introduction. Thank you for that. And, and I'm now going to introduce Ruth Dalton, who's going to talk to us about um, the northern lot. Ruth works for Cumbria Farmer Network. And uh, Ruth, over to you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thanks, Stu. You. you haven't stolen my thunder too badly. So, can everybody see the screen? Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, if you can launch the slide, I work for the Farmer Network in Cumbria, but this project actually stretched. Ah, thought I had. It says you are screen sharing. Not sure what else I can do. Yeah, that's can stop that's sharing. That, start sharing again. No, no, Ruth, that's fine. We can see it now. Thank you. Okay, I think there just must be a lag on my very rural internet. So yes, in the um, in the north, we actually stretched right across from the northwest to the northeast because we did have a couple of clusters in Northumberland as well. But I would reiterate what Stu has just said, which is that this is a massively successful project so far. We were oversubscribed in the north really quite rapidly and had a really brilliant reaction from the vets. Actually, I have to give huge credit to my vets in my region because they really took hold of this project and ran with it and have given so much added value as we've gone along. So has, this, has the slide changed? I'm hoping, can someone nod or shake their head? Hello? It hasn't changed. Okay, it's just obviously very slow. Let me see if I can change something here. Hopefully it'll catch up with me in a minute. So it's a map of my clusters and it's showing you that there were seven in the north. Four of those were commons, so they, we try to encompass every commoner on the common. Obviously those sheep, although they may stay to their hefts, will also be mixing with each other at certain times of year on the commons, so it's important to, to demonstrate that this project could work in a commoning system. Three of them were contiguous farms, so neighbouring farmers with shared boundaries in a group. And I would say that the project revealed a fast array of attitudes to sheep scab from the cluster that Stu described where they said, oh, we're not sure we'd like to take part because we don't have a problem with scab. Um, to people who are really begging us um, to let them into the project because they knew that they did have a problem. 
I'm going to change the slide and hopefully you will see at some point uh, a picture of some rather unfortunate looking sheep. Jo, can you see a different slide? Because you're the one I can see on my screen. And um, we've literally just caught up with your map, so I'm sure we will get to see the sheep, but it might be okay, another minute. So I'm yeah. going to carry on. <laughs> um, this is actually what we didn't see. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, hopefully the, the scabby looking sheep will appear on the screen, uh, which I snapped with my phone the other day. So they're actually uh, something that we didn't see in any of our clusters. And it's really important to highlight this, that uh, the test is so accurate. And the best thing about it is it catches the scab before you have these really miserable looking sheep that are causing economic harm to the farmer and welfare issues to the sheep. So we, we didn't really see clinical scab um, at all in the clusters. So interestingly, we did see some of that, but not at the time of testing. So it really highlights that the test catches this very serious disease in its tracks and enables us to treat <clears throat> before it's a problem. So I'm going to carry on. Hopefully, uh, I should have maybe changed the slides like five minutes before I want to. Um, but the next slide that I'm going to talk about is really just, I thought I'd give a variety of quotes that I've had as part of the project from different people that have been involved. And one of the most common things I heard was the positive result was a real surprise. So mostly the positives in the clusters were not who anyone in the cluster thought was positive and, and they certainly didn't think they were positive themselves. So that's a really important lesson from the project. Also from one of my vets, they've had more client projects. So this general raised awareness about sheep scab, people are prepared to put their hand in their pocket and pay for it because they can see that it's really working within the project and within the cluster. And we've also had um, people who we really stress the importance of dipping as, as one of the best methods of control. So we've had more people going to use contractors this year, having not dipped for a long time, having moved over to injectables. So that message about the dipping is really getting through. And also, you know, after the shock's worn off of how much scab there might be, um, that they have a proper plan to get on top of scab. I'm going to stop sharing, hopefully my internet will Thank you. Sorry, I'm hopefully everybody can hear me at the moment. I can see. Oh, no, it's gone. We can hear you, Leslie. You can hear me, can you? Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Ruth. That was excellent. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one having problems. It's not easy, is it? Uh, normally, I would have shown your slides for you, uh, but um, I couldn't even do that. I think we're <coughs> We've lost Leslie now. Um, I'll, um, I've just put a note in the chat. I've just put a note in the chat saying that we'll sli share the slides afterwards so that people can catch up. Um, but it's over to Kate next, I believe, who is running the um, the project in the Midlands. So over to you, Kate. You'll need to unmute, Kate. There you go. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, we can see those, Kate. Yeah, great, thank you. Just put it on full screen. Okay. Um, right, oh, this looks like I'm gonna have trouble. I've just got a bit of a notice saying low system resources may affect your audio quality. So are you hearing me clearly at the moment, Joe? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, I'm Kate Phillips. I'm an independent sheep consultant who worked for 30 years of my life for ADAS, um, along with Leslie, and um, also with uh, Karen Wheeler in ADAS. Um, uh, I'm now working with Karen and others in ADAS, Katie Evans in particular, um, on this project in the Midlands. ADAS are doing the majority of the coordination in terms of the administration, thank goodness. And I've been um, uh, instrumental in gathering farmers to join the uh, project, basically. 
Um, and just like with Ruth, we've had fantastic engagement by our veterinary practices. And I've listed the ones that we're working with in particular. In uh, one of our areas, we're working with State Police, Shropshire Farm Vets and Bishop Castle Vets, who have been fantastic and really put their back into getting these farms tested and um, doing the advisory visits now um, or showing them exactly what they should be doing rather than what they might have been doing, for instance, showering their sheep in the past. Um, we've also got a second area where the other vets, Seven Edge, Tenbury Farm Vets and March's uh, vets are working with us. Um, so, yeah, exactly like Stuart said in his, um, uh, in his, or showed with his map, um, we are in a real hotspot area in Shropshire and Herefordshire. Um, we did get started trying to get a cluster in Herefordshire as well, but we've ended up with two uh, clusters in Shropshire only, um, which is fine. We've got our hundred farmers or just about in the area. Um, and it's sort of, I guess it's slightly making it easier um, to have it all in Shropshire. Um, we've had good engagement generally. Um, I've had a few quotes from farmers saying thanks for helping because they've been up against this scab problem in the area for quite a long time and they feel really positive that somebody is actually doing something to help them fight this problem. Um, our vets and mobile dippers are all in agreement and um, we've had very good engagement on the whole. Um, some of the area we're covering has common grazing, like Ruth up in the north. Um, the Long Mind and the Sniper Stones um, are two particular areas with common grazing, but also we've got a small area on the Clee Hills as well that we're looking at. And it's a great opportunity to pull people together and make a concerted effort to control this disease. So this is a map just to show you where we are with one of the clusters. It's a very large cluster and that brings a few problems for us because we've got nearly 80 farmers in this area who are taking part. Um, it's sort of, we tried to work it as one cluster, but there are some logistical problems in coordination of treatments with that many farms, but we're trying our best. So you can see where this area is. It's southwest of um, Shrewsbury, going from Shrewsbury right down to Craven Arms and across to Bishop's Castle in southwest Shropshire. Um, so, and we've tried very hard to keep, um, uh, it's only farmers who graze sheep in that area. Some people, of course, have farms outside the area, but graze sheep within the area. So that's important to recognise that there are people who have um, bring sheep over the border, perhaps, um, or just have outlying farms that are across the A49 to the um, east. So we have 77 farmers signed up in the Long Minden Stones area, um, and we've completed a testing on 75 farms, which has been great. Um, we've had an interesting um, selection of results. We've had 16 positive um, tests, which is 21% of flocks, which is above Stuart's average that he gave earlier of 10 to 15% of national flocks being infected. Um, but we are yeah, seeing that sort of level. And that has been picked up as clinical and preclinical signs of the disease. So, um, and a lot of farmers weren't aware they had scab um, and th those positive ones um, and have been able to act sooner than they would have done normally. Um, the advisory visits by the vets who are out there trying to persuade farmers to use best practice, dipping preferably, and really um, sticking to manufacturer's guidelines on the ML use. And we've had over 81% of those farms visited by their vet to give an advisory visit, which has been great from those vets. The other area, which maybe if you're not familiar with this area of Shropshire, is between um, the towns of Ludlow and Bridge North, um, basically another sort of area of South Shropshire in the Clee Hills. And there's one particular area called the Brown Clee, where we have 20 farmers. This has been a cluster that sort of took some time to get um, up and running, but we have 20 farmers signed up now and testing is underway. It's sort of happening now, January and February. So we hope to be complete with that very shortly. Um, just one thing that really has, has been a challenge for us, this looks a bit of an odd map, um, but what we need to find is all areas where sheep are grazed by each farmer to be identified. So we have completed maps and asked farmers to colour in where they graze their sheep. And we found, you know, a lot of farmers would have, it's not just the home farm, of course, they've got five, six areas where they're grazing their sheep across our areas. And we've even got some farmers who are farmers in Wales who have areas of land within Shropshire. And we've, 
you know, it's disappointing, but we have one or two farmers who are very reluctant to join um, the project and they potentially are causing us some issues with um, re-emergence of uh, scab in some, uh, in some flocks. So we are really trying to encourage everybody who grazes in the areas to take part because that's the only way we're going to really win through. Um, just to say our contact numbers uh, for myself and for Karen Wheeler in ADAS, um, there they are. And we actually have a project um, email address, scabherefordshropshire at adas.co.uk. So if anybody wanted to speak to us um, or contact us via that route, we'd be very happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I've got Leslie or not, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna carry on. So that's um, two out of the three um, regions in England involved in this project. So across to the third one, which is down in the southwest, which is being ran by NSA. And um, so my colleague Sean Riches will come in at this point. Good morning, thanks, Joe. Um, just checking, can you see the, the slides? Full screen, great. Okay, thanks very much. <coughs> so yeah, as uh, Joe said, we've been looking after the South -est, Southwest uh, and we've been able to take advantage of the local knowledge provided by the Exmoor Hill Farming Network. And uh, with their local network officer, Catherine Williams, working alongside the uh, NSA Southwest Regional Manager, Ian May. Their understanding, not only of the topography and the geography, but also of the farm layouts, as Kate was alluding to there, you know, with sheep dotted in different areas is quite common within sheep farming. Um, but also very importantly, the various relationships between those farms, the families of some of those farms, uh, and also their, their vets and other advisors. One thing that's been keen is that overarching coordination has involved a significant amount of legwork and that local knowledge has ensured good recruitment, um, ongoing engagement and positive discussions, particularly where multiple vet practices have been involved uh, in those clusters. At the kickoff, we also choose to engage with uh, SQPs, Ramas from the local animal health distributors, local auctioneers and trading standards to make sure everybody who has some interest in SCAB was involved um, and helped spread the word and encourage an involvement. All these different organisations have so many strengths and actually pulling them all together meant we have the best possible impact for those on the ground actually coordinating. The collaboration it has facilitated has enabled cooperation to discuss the project, the results and the local and immediate implications such as treatment plans, sheep movements and future actions. The questions raised through the various discussions show the importance of having expert advice available and the support, not necessarily always being on farm, but also making use of other uh, forums has proved really beneficial. So there's a map of, of the area showing the, the areas. There's just over 100 farms we actually signed up, um, 102 totally, roughly covering 40% of the area, covering some common grazing, uh, but contiguous farms and seven different vet practices uh, and a number of vets involved in that. What has been key and I think this has come through in all of these is how how much communication is key. Um, it, the initial engagement was very much key to making sure everybody in, understands the value of the, the approach, how the ELISA uh, blood test was being used and what a particular result may mean. And then keeping everyone informed using Zoom meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, newsletters, and the bi-monthly uh, NSA sheet farm. Yeah, no, no. right. Has enabled every, very, concentrate, very concentrated discussions from a local level. Are you clusters of farms where a positive result has ind indicated the pro presence of SCAB to much wider regional discussions on progress and contribution to the development of the project? One thing that came out really strongly at the recent uh, meeting was how there now appears to be greater agreement amongst farmers that the stigma of having sheep scab is far less than it was. Several used the comment, it's not a crime to have it, but it is a crime not to do something about it. Um, and that's really um, underpinned a lot of the discussions that we've heard throughout this, the, uh, the project. How we actually 
treat an outbreak effectively obviously would depend on the time of the year, the farmers involved, the type of area, lambing times and shearing times amongst others. But we have seen uh, has has been indicated something in the other in some of the other areas um, move back to the use of dips, um, but where it's been necessary strategic use of microcyclic lactones as well. One thing that the test has helped identify is obviously the presence of much more uh, subclinical scab, but also potentially uh, the um, uh, resistance some resistant mites, which we've been able to provide more than to see. Um, to develop a colony for, for future testing. As a national organisation, yeah, NSA wants to see the learnings taken from this spread much wider to, to inform future discussions on ways to break that cycle of scab. Uh, there is a definite appetite amongst farmers, their vets and advisors for a cooperative approach to managing this costly disease. The opportunities with initiatives such as the Animal Health Pathway, um, offered in England and similar schemes as they're developed in the devolved nations presents a prime platform to enable the learnings from this project and this approach to be taken forward, to be supported, promoted and, and implemented to provide some national coverage. And that's me. Thanks, Sean. Um, Leslie's not stepping in, so I'm going to carry on. Um, so that's um, that's um, Stuart's provided the overview of the RDP project, and we've heard from all three projects. And um, by all means, pop questions in the chat if you've got them at this stage. But we will do a proper Q and A at the end. But we'll carry on now to having a look at what's happening in Wales. Um, Leslie was going to deliver those slides, but obviously her internet isn't good enough for it. So Stu is going to take over at this point and talk about Wales. Okay, just let me share those slides. And okay, can you see those slides? Perfect. Okay, so yeah. So just a quick update on on where we are in um, in Wales at the moment. So um, this this follows on from work that was carried out last winter, around the same time, February, uh, March uh, last year, when we did some, some coordinated testing based on um, positive uh, index uh, farms, and then testing uh, that, that were, were confirmed by clinical scab. And then we did testing of the contiguous properties around those um, to, to try to control, uh, to control the spread as a, as a pilot project. So, um, so this is a follow up from that. So the plan again is to identify two index farms, um, again, where they have had uh, Seropteus ovis uh, infestation confirmed through skin scrapes. Contiguous properties uh, tested with the ELISA and then uh, coordinated treatments um, as and when required, preferably using OP um, dipping uh, contractors, mobile uh, dipping contractors. Um, there was also a desire to try to identify a common um, as well, um, so that we could look at screening uh, animals coming uh, going on onto, the, onto that common ground. Um, so two areas are identified. Um, area one, there were five farms in total. Um, one farm was not willing to participate in the project, but four were. Three of those were, were positive by the ELISA, with one result still pending as, as we speak now. Um, and those three positive farms um, have now had coordinated uh, dipping. Um, in area two, there were eight farms. Everybody participated, which is, is great news. Eight, eight, eight were tested, uh, two were positive, three were negative, and there are three pending results still coming. And those the three positive farms, which are the two that were positive and the original index um, farm, um, have all now been um, dipped as well. Um, other activities, so this week actually what we are um, undertaking are some veterinary sort of seed PD events. So there's two events, one in South Wales and one in North Wales. They're, they're both actually going to be held virtually. Um, and that's where we will try to provide all of the vets in those regions um, with, with sort of best, best practice um, advice on not just control of scab, but also um, the use of the use of the of the blood test um, to try to to, to try to um, help in that process as well. 
Um, we're trying to provide additional dipping to um, contract dippers. And I think that by me to have a, a role in that part. And there's also a few stakeholder information days for, for, for farmers that, that might want to be in, involved in, in that project in the future as well. Um, but overall, I think that, that, that what's key is that we're really just trying to ensure that the industry is in, is in a really good place um, to start to work initially on the controller scab. And I guess ultimately, um, certainly for, for Wales, the aim at the moment is to, to try to eradicate um, scab in, uh, in, in Wales long, long term. Um, that, I think, is, um, is me. Yeah, there you go. Short and sweet. Thanks, June. And <laughs> do, um, do you want to just clarify who the partners were in that M Welsh project? Oh yes, I do. Uh, so, so it's actually Neil Payton um, who's running that, uh, and um, uh, I don't know who the other partners are actually at this stage. I'm afraid. Um, oh, sorry, that's a terrible, terrible lie. Um, it's it's obviously more done. Um, uh, Neil Payton, who's who's coordinating, and then the Welsh Veterinary Science Centre who are offering all the, um, the blood testing in that, in that project as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, on to Scotland next. Um, this is gonna be a brief one because we're not allowed to say too much about what's happening in Scotland at the moment. Um, but Grace Reid um, is the um, NSA Scottish Region Coordinator up in Scotland um, and she's gonna tell us as much as she can. And um, Jen Craig, who's the NSA Chairman, and um, this is the reason that NSA is involved in what's going on in Scotland, is um, the Chairman of the um, of the Scottish SCAB group that's been put together fairly recently. But Grace, I'll um, explain all of that. Over to you. Good morning everybody and thank you for having me along. Um, so what I can confirm is that the Scottish Government are in receipt of a proposal for a two-year strategy and they have given their agreement in principle. So the next uh, meeting of the Scottish Government Working Group is actually tomorrow and this is, this is where the proposals will be discussed in more detail before being fully costed and has been taken back to Scottish ministers. ministers. So we are delighted to be chairing the, the Scottish Government SCAB Working Group and we're looking forward to what we can achieve, not only in the animal health and welfare side of things, but the climate change um, ones too. So it, it's obviously very clear that Scotland has went down the route of the climate change plan, what they hope to get out of it, and we need to try and reduce the carbon and methane footprints per output of the sheep and contribute to the outcomes of the climate change plan. So it's basically a matter of keeping uh, an eye on this space and uh, hopefully updates will come very, very soon. That's great. Thanks, Grace. Did you want to add anything to that, Stu? Because I know that Mordun's involved in that bid as well. Uh, yeah, prob probably not at this stage, but just to say that obviously we're, we're going to be um, having broader discussions with the, the sheep scab industry working group tomorrow. And obviously that brings together all of the main uh, stakeholder groups um, in, in Scotland. So um, so I suspect we'll, we'll probably have a clearer picture, you know, in the, in the coming days and weeks. So. Thank you. OK, so now Paul Crawford is going to take over from here and talk about what's happening in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Okay, can somebody just give me a wave or a nod if you can see this slides have come up okay? Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much for taking us, giving us the opportunity to share what's happening in Northern Ireland. It was noticeable uh, in Stu's opening slides where he showed distribution of scab in the UK that not only did Northern Ireland not have any data on the sheep, but Northern Ireland wasn't even on the map. And that is pretty much where we have been for a number of years with sheep scab control and eradication in Northern Ireland. I just need to get these slides to move. In 2018-2019, industry-wide was concern was expressed informally. This was when we were at other meetings, we were at other events, uh, stakeholder leaders, presidents of vet associations, NSA folk, uh, committee members of the Farmers Union. When we were talking, as we always do, about this and that, SCAB just kept getting mentioned more and more frequently. And up until 2018, I'd seen SCAB once in my 40-something years. Um, 2018 and 2019, I couldn't go out for a drive around the countryside without seeing SCAB somewhere and sometimes everywhere. So March 2019, an open meeting was held for all industry stakeholders. And that was 
a presentation by Neil Patton on the work he was doing in Wales at that stage, followed by questions and answers, and they range very generally from SCAB uh, as a disease, control, treatment methods, uh, filling in lots of knowledge gaps, to more considered questions about uh, what are we going to do about this as, as a group rather than as individual farmers. There was an indicative vote at the end of that meeting that we decided that we needed to do something more. And a group of representatives from all those sectors that you see listed there have been meeting regularly in Northern Ireland since uh, that uh, spring of 2019. The early part of the COVID pandemic certainly slowed progress down. We were just getting to the point where we were starting to develop some resources. We've got banners and think we were going to go out around markets and go to shows. Uh, so we had to re reassess our, our plans uh, temporarily with the onset of COVID. During those meetings that we had, and they moved from face to face to Zoom over time uh, over the last two years, we explored some of the barriers uh, to better control. We invited people with expertise in particular areas, so diagnostics with uh, Rebecca from BioBest team uh, joined our meetings, uh, Jason Barley from AFBE. Uh, we had policy officers from the Department of Agriculture, we had uh, folk from the Environment Agency came to us to speak about. Uh, issues around uh, dip control and licensing. We started working on uh, proactively sharing information about SCAB. We tried to target that to the early part of the or the, the early part of the autumn, late summer, early autumn. Uh, we developed some resources that were downloadable online. That was Animal Health and Welfare in Northern Ireland led on on those online resources. And any of us who had the chance speaking to our members or when the press spoke to us about what's happening in your industry and uh, we're, we're just kept pushing the message of, of sheep scab and the importance of keeping it out of your flock and if it is in your flock to get it stamped out as quick as possible. We've been actively lobbying uh, the assembly while it was there, it's now gone again uh, so that's slightly in abeyance but we did get an opportunity just before Christmas uh, to brief and uh, do a, an oral briefing to the Agricultural Rural Affairs Committee uh, at Stormont uh, to explain what we were up to and why we thought there was a problem that needed uh, dealt with. Research uh, is almost absent in Northern Ireland with regard to the distribution of sheep scab, the prevalence of sheep scab, people's knowledge about sheep scab, anything about sheep scab uh, is just absent from the literature. As part of a PhD program from Harper University, which I'm uh, undertaking at the minute, uh, I ran a survey. It was had to be internet based because it was this time last year. Uh, results are currently in peer review, but broadly speaking, there is a lot more scab out there than the Department of Agriculture figures suggest. Uh, we have identified cases throughout all six counties. We identified cases on common grazing, four different commons in four different parts of the country. And there were certainly plenty of knowledge gaps, uh, as well as evidence of poor practice with regards to treatment and prevention. So our next steps, uh, we joined the uh, group uh, with a joint group bid in to DBSRC for a one-year project, which is focused on the endemic disease. And we're going to use, if we get the money, uh, that's going to be used to explore uh, knowledge get more prevalence details, explore further some of the barriers that have been highlighted in my PhD work, and also develop further the economic and the environmental costs of sheep scab, tying in a little bit to what was just mentioned about the Scottish uh, group and what, what, what they're talking to their government about at the minute. We see uh, the, particularly the economics and the environment, the human economics uh, welfare issues, as well as the financial uh, welfare. And, uh, the team for that grant bid is led by Stuart Burgess. Not only does he know a lot about sheep scam, but he also knows a lot about filling in very complicated forms. And we're certainly indebted to, to Stuart and guys at Morden for the help in getting that grant application over the line. And we're just waiting to see what comes back from that. So the other partners in that, apart from our group, is Animal Health and Welfare Northern Ireland, who would be doing most of the boot work on the ground, coordinating that if the project comes to pass. And AFBE, will be leading on the environmental and economic costs. So in conclusion, we've got a strong group. It was industry led. It came from the industry at the start. This wasn't anything anyone told us to do. This is something we decided we wanted to do. Ultimately, we do want to see SCAB eradicated, but we also know that before we can get even to the point of doing control programs, we need to do a little bit more research 
to work out what's feasible and where the problems lie specifically in Northern Ireland. That requires funding and it also requires legislative support. As we've seen in Northern Ireland from our BVD eradication programme, it's got 95% of the way there, but we've got a problem where we can't nail down those last couple of farmers. We can't notify the neighbours that they're there at risk from a PI on farm and they're potentially for some issues uh, with undertaking tracings which is more of an issue for our sheep scab than it is for the BVD, but it's highlighted, BVD problem situation has highlighted how it's important to get the legislative support in at the beginning. Don't rely on your ministers or your assembly to, to come good with the legislation further down the line, because we are now in a situation with BVD where we're sort of holding, we haven't made progress for a year because we haven't got the legislation in place and we now don't have a legislator in place either. Uh, so we want to try and avoid that, uh, that learn that lesson from BPD. So happy to take questions uh, or contact me after the briefing uh, if anyone doesn't have a chance to get to speak to me today. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we've got um, we've got about ten minutes now to do um, to take any questions that people have. Um, it's just worth saying that although um, although Leslie's internet isn't working so well, and, and we all know Leslie is a face no, of Scops, just in case. Um, then um, I'm here as Scop Secretariat. We've also got um, Kevin Harrison on the call, who is Scop's chairman, and Robert Helliwell, who is the deputy chairman. Um, so we've got a good Scops offering here, even if Leslie isn't um, on a hundred percent internet connection. Um, I don't know if it'd be fair to put you on the spot, Kevin, but do you want to talk a little bit about what Scops has done lately in terms of um, the work we've done scab wise? So we've got the the dipper code, which is out um, on the scab front, and then there's other bits and pieces going in terms of just making sure that the conversation keeps happening and that best practice information is out there. Obviously, the beauty of SCOPS and the reason we're able to pull something together like this is because SCOPS is a UK wide group. We've got the involvement from everybody on a regular basis to keep being able to do this comparison between the devolved nations and help with what Stuart was saying is the problem with them. Sometimes things can be slightly disjointed across the four, across the four nations. And so, I'm, so Ken, I'll come to you or if Leslie's internet's good enough, we can go to Leslie on that one. Uh, yeah, I don't know if Leslie is there, but um, I know she's having trouble. Um, I didn't intend to speak today, but I think as a, as a farmer, these projects are so encouraging, uh, you know, just to see what's going on. And the, and the blood blood test is a game changer as well. Um, and, and other things that Scots are doing and working with that, you know, last year when we improved our quarantine um, information and graphics and, and the best use of medicines there, and again, the use of um, the correct use of OPs. Um, you know, if, if if we're not using the OPs correctly and we're putting them through jetters and things like that, then we we are at danger of creating um, you know resistance to OPs. So using those products correctly, and protecting them, and these projects are showing you know in these clusters how much scab is there and how important it is to get it under control. And also, it, it just encourages it shows the importance of. Um, working together and talking and not just you know pointing your finger over the hedge just working together to try and get it sorted farmers and vets all, all together but there is a great deal and there's some great stuff on our, our website on our technical manual on um, on sheep scab and, and prevention as well thanks kevin um, Patsy at Scottish Farmers put a question in the chat on, on some leading on from that really about, about the prevalence. Do we have any prevalence figures specifically for Scotland, Patsy's after, but what are the figures like across the UK, Stu? Yeah, so um, I mean, we're still working on, on prevalence data that we have from, you know, around sort of 10, 15 years ago. Um, I mean, we don't anticipate it's changed dramatically from that sort of figure of around 10 to 15 percent. But what we have to remember is that there are areas, these hotspot areas, you know, kind of within Scotland also, um, you know, so, so scab is more prevalent in, in the, the northeast and the southwest. Predominantly, that's because that, that's where most of the, the sheep populations are, are clustered. Um, but there are other areas within, within Scotland that, that do represent kind of good targets for, for future control. Um, in Scotland, it's slightly different as well because the disease is notifiable. 
Um, so if we look at the notification data, again, it pretty much kind of follows that same pattern, um, but without a doubt, as, as in, the, in the rest of the UK, um, sheep scab is underreported. And that's probably because of that, that, that stigma um, that, that Sean mentioned, but I, I think Sean's um, right that that stigma is slowly, is slowly starting to, 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 to dissipate, which is really encouraging um, for control. So is it those prevalence figures that were used to decide where the three regions were for the RDPE project, Stuart? Um, Edward Adams was just asking about how, um, <clears throat> I guess, within, within the English project across those three regions, but also specifically within the regions, where to decide where the um, clusters went, where to target. Yeah, so so for, for the RDPE programme, um, obviously the... the the, the prediction data in terms of connectivity and density of, of, of farms highlighted those those free those free regions in in terms of um, Hereford and Shropshire, um, Cumbria, and but also some of the the, the, the sort of neighbouring um, counties, and then down in the southwest in terms of Cornwall and and Devon, and that. With that, we were able to identify the best people and groups to work with within those areas. And then it was where can we, where can we um, get the best sort of um, opportunities for success in terms of the, 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 the specific um, regions that, that we look to, to control. And obviously in the Southwest, um, the NSA were able to identify um, the Exmoor Hill Farming Network who have been crucial in, in bringing that area together. Um, in the Midlands, it's obviously focused then on, on some of the, the areas that, um, that, that Kate mentioned. And that's really because we've been able to get farmers and vets together to work collectively um, in, those, in those areas. And then the same in, in the north, where we focused on, on certain areas of, of common grazing, but also areas where people have worked together previously. Because I think if we can tap into those existing networks, um, then that you know that that's kind of half the battle because if you can get people together thinking collectively, then you have a really good a really good opportunity. So that's kind of the approach that we've taken. Okay, so it's, it's as much about people and networks as it is about actual data on the sheep themselves. Yeah, I think I think I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, and then the next question has come from Hannah at Farmers Guardian. I think is picking up on um, on on what was mentioned from Paul in the Northern Ireland presentation there about the legislation. Um, which is always a, always a bit of a tricky one. Um, I know that SCOPS as a group has been talking with the uh, all-party parliamentary group on animal welfare to look at this situation. Um, and I we were hoping to hear back from them later this year. I think the sp springtime is when we're expecting to hear back to them about whether they were taking that forward at all. Um, I don't know who's best place to make a comment on legislation across the whole of the UK piece, though. Do you want to take that one as well, Stuart? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Um, you know, so obviously here we're talking about individual um, sort of nation approaches, but um, I think Scots have, have been really leading then on trying to join that up. And, and one of the mechanisms has been that all party parliamentary um, working group on animal welfare. Um, but we are obviously co keeping coordination and keeping um, communication going with the different devolved nations as well. So, um, and I think you can see from, you know, the presenters this morning that that we're all collectively working towards the, the same approach, but I think we do need a few of those additional tools in terms of, you know, some further legislation may well be required, um, but yeah, to give us the best opportunity to, to try to eradicate SCAB in the future, um, and, and that I think is a much more longer term aim, you know, then, then, then we really do have to start to coordinate efforts across the, across the nations in order to have the best success. Can I just say as well on that, on that group, the government have always said that the industry sort of needs to, to lead on this and they'd, they'd back us up. Well, I think, you know, by today's presentation, you can see that the industry is pushing this forward with funding from from different areas and the, and the government. So, you know, a bit more funding as well would help and help us push these kind of schemes out further and embrace more farmers. But, you know, I think now the industry really is putting into this. So it is time now for the government to come in and back us up and support us a bit more. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, we said we keep this to an hour, so I think we'll probably will wrap it up here. But um, everybody's got um, got contact details for various folks, and you can come through myself as well. So please do send requests for any more information. Um, I, all the speakers can send me their slides, particularly yours, Ruth, because we weren't able to see all of those. And then I'll collect them into one pack and share them with attendees as well. Um, and yeah, like I say, we're all here, happy to take questions, and um, we're hoping to do um, some more Scott press release uh, Scott's press briefings through the year and um, won't be scabbed for the next one but we're hoping to do this on a regular basis just come together for short sharp sessions every now and then to keep um, people abreast of what's happening in them um, in the area of um, sustainable parasite control not just on the external um, parasites so thank you everyone for joining today for this section and um, for this people on the call who are here from the SCOP steering group we've got another session from 11 to 12 on a completely different topic so steering group members please stay on the line everyone else really huge thank you for your time we'll get some more information out to you and please come back if you've got any specific questions thank you very much